Thank, thank you for uh, having me today. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, trails here in Center Wellington and specifically the loops that uh, we've tried to develop. Um, I'm on the first slide there. You'll see the Center Wellington trail loops and a runner there heading across, uh, I think that's the Trestle Bridge Trail. So if we could move to the next slide, Devlin, which is page eight of 40. Um, so some of the components of this system that we've been working on is uh, some print media, a brochure. Um, it's intended for visitors or residents. Um, we'll have signage along these routes, um, sharrows, which are share the road arrows, and you'll see an example of that later, some line painting, and finally, kiosks. I'll talk about that as well. Uh, next slide. Okay, so on page 9 of 40 there, you'll see um, what is sort of the unfolded version of the uh, part of the brochure. Um, and what you should notice down the uh, right hand side is uh, five loops, one of which is technically not a loop, number two there, but um, we tried to keep it simple for the user and we're currently trying to implement the um, first loop, which is the river loop. And you'll see a little more on the next slide. So move on to uh, 10 of 40. Okay, so um, the orange there, the river loop, is really the focus of today's discussion. That's what we're, uh, where we're starting. These loops are the culmination of the county's active transportation plan and the township's trails master plan. So these routes follow uh, routes that were identified in those plans and are is building upon uh, what was recommended in those plans. Um, the intention here was to try and offer a variety uh, within the constraints of what, you know, the, the layout of the towns and the existing uh, road and trail networks. The first loop, River Loop the number one, is the one we're working on, and its primary focus is to just move people between Fergus and Alora in the most efficient manner possible. Um, it's not really intended to be a sightseeing loop. It's meant for cyclists and pedestrians, but um, some of the focus is largely on cyclists getting um, and commuting between the two towns, if you will. Um, there's no reason you couldn't walk it, but um, as you can see, it's largely on road uh, while entirely on road um, at County Road 18 and then on the south side, South River Road. Um, <clears throat> so each of these trails sort of has its own um, focus. And as you can see, Loop 5 is called the Trails Loop, and it is really the main loop that utilizes our existing um, off-road trails, like the Trestle Bridge Trail and that portion of the Cataract Trail. So if you would move on to the next slide, Devlin. This is another part of the brochure that's a little more zoomed in for, um, for detail in, in downtown Fergus and Alora. Um, you can see there that there's the uh, Loop 2, the Upper Grand Gorge Trail. Uh, for safety reasons, it's not really a loop right now, uh, but I do hope that in the future, um, with some improvements and some uh, sidewalks and reconstruction, we'll be able to um, make that a loop. Um, my personal experience is that loops, I find loops quite desirable and uh, I hope you all agree. So that's sort of the uh, 
format for these uh, for these improvements. Um, loop three is uh, a, a, a small loop in uh, downtown Alora as well that takes you through Bissell Park. And so loop two and three are really designed to for uh, foot traffic mainly, primarily. Uh, certainly the Upper Grand Gorge Trail is for foot traffic, um, but uh, pedestrian or cycling could use uh, the Bissell Park Loop. And then lastly, the Riverwalk Loop is throughout downtown Fergus and is primarily for foot traffic um, and takes you across the bridges and, uh, and along the river walk um, behind the library. So the hope is, is that we have so much success with our first loop that um, continuing the process is going to be a little bit easier as we uh, move on. I think that's all I wanted to say about that. You can move on to the next slide, Devlin, uh, slide 12. Uh, so this is an example of the signage that we are developing that you would encounter when on a loop. Um, it's hopefully nice and clear to trail users. Um, and with a brochure in hand, uh, they're sure not to get lost. Um, it tries to maintain some branding of the uh, the colors and the design of the sign itself so that um, whether you're looking at it on paper or you're actually out in the real world, you will find it uh, easy to identify where you are and where you're going. If you go to the next slide on page 13, it's the same sign um, with an example of the share the road sign that you will uh, that we will have on to be determined locations. Um, each of these types of signs, the one on the top would uh, be at key locations, uh, wherever perhaps the uh, trail or the loop changes direction, or you encounter another loop that shares the same path. Um, but the share the road uh, sign that would potentially go below it um, would be at key locations that we have not yet determined. And um, I think that kind of covers the mapping of the loops and the signage of them. Um, the next slide on page 14, Devlin, is I think where Matt was going to take over for me. Thanks, Greg. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about um, our pavement marking strategy. So it's not really my area of expertise, but I've been um, assisting where and when I can. And uh, I just also wanted to thank Greg for all his hard work and um, just say that I'm really pleased with the quality of the signage that we've come up with so far in the mapping. And um, I really hope that it um, becomes used and is useful in the future. So uh, to speak to this slide, this style of uh, Shero, um, we've selected because it's high contrast, so it's very visible to um, uh, commuters. And if, if we move on to the next slide, you can see an example of it using the city of Kitchener. And you'll notice that um, this uh, Shero is placed in the middle of the travel lane of the road. So what it's what it's saying is that there's no space on the road for a cyclist to be on the on the on the outside edge beside the curb. So the in order for it to be a safe area to cycle, we're allowing the cyclists to use the center of the lane. Um, and there's been you know, mixed results in different areas, but overall it's, it's, it seems the positive addition to the cycling infrastructure of a, of a city. Uh, and if we can move to the next one, I'll talk about um, 
the type of um, product we're, we're looking at at the moment. There's different ways of doing it. So we're looking at a surface applied durable MMA. So that's methyl methacrylate, asphalt marking. And it, um, it's installed no different than any other paint, but it's uh, more akin to a plastic. It's highly durable. It's much more expensive, but the application is nearly identical. So if we were gonna, if we were gonna make a share out of traditional oil-based paints, the cost of the material would be really low, maybe 10 cents um, a square foot versus $6 a square foot. But the, the method of application is the same, and that's what a lot of the cost ends up being. Um, so we'll, I'll speak to that a little bit more in later slides. Um, and on the next one, this is your traditional oil-based paint. We're looking at um, some additional bike lane painting. I don't know if that's the right term for it, but essentially we're showing where the, the um, paved shoulder um, is clearly marked with that, that white line. And that's so that um, there's a space for cyclists to be away from the, the main uh, lane of travel. So in, in our area, we've got, we're fortunate to have several areas that already have this in place. Uh, South River Road's one example, and also the section of um, uh, East Mill Street between Fergus and Laura. The two sections that we'd like to add this line painting is both the north and south side of St. Andrew Street West. There's a section between Red Alban and Beatty Line um, that is wide enough uh, for a one meter uh, bike lane with this white line painted on either side. And so that's something we'd like to propose to the county. And by doing this, um, we can avoid having shares in this area and it can be safe for the, for the cyclists. This will include the, the signage that Greg showed before. So um, we think this is a good strategy. The other area is East Mill Street, only on the north side, and that's between the uh, Laura Public School and um, right down to the bridge. So there's only space on the north side, and that's because previously there was parking on that side and the other side there was not. The, so I've, I've met with Rob Rosso and, and, and speaking with Colin and Infrastructure, and they are planning to, um, to keep that parking there. So there's an opportunity to have a wider um, bike lane, similar to this one, or depending on their discussion with the, with, um, the county, uh, the, the combination of bike lanes could be uh, addressed in different ways. So moving on to the next slide. This is a budget estimate I put together just so we know sort of the, um, an estimate of what it could cost. The numbers could go up based on quantity or, or unit price. Uh, we've got a quote for the signs. Um, they're quite affordable. So we're looking at two different types of signs. The custom root sign is, is a uh, reflective, it's a high quality reflective sign, but it's not the same quality as the, um, the yellow ones that we showed earlier. Those are MTO regulated signs and they have a very um, special type of reflective surface and um, therefore they're a little bit more expensive. Um, we are planning to have our own infrastructure staff install the signs and they do that um, regularly. So they're quite capable of doing it. And each sign we've got, we've got mapping showing where we'd like to put each one, but it'll have to be sort of the field fit or a public works staff decide exactly where it needs to go based on where the other signs in the area. And there'll be opportunities to, to uh, work with existing infrastructure. What the large cost of this project will be is the sharrows. Um, the durable MMA paint is expensive, uh, but we still think it's a good idea. And we'll talk about that a bit more with the um, life cycle maintenance of, um, of that type of product. Bike lanes is, is uh, a lower cost. And it's something I think we should consider doing as part of this project. But I believe that um, 
those bike lanes should be maintained by the county where they're on the on the county roads and by the township on the ten township uh, roads. So that will be part of the discussion with the county. Um, just to quickly give a background, we we've already spoken to our counterparts at the county. Um, Colin from infrastructure has started that conversation, and this is the these slides are what we'd like to present to them um, to get buy-in, but also to continue to discuss, discuss options. Um, move it to the next slide, please. So the maintenance of the signage, we've gotten some slightly more up-to-date information. So the, the custom reflective sign uh, lifespan, it's a seven-year warranty, but a 10-year expected um, lifespan and the high intensity MTO signs are, are 10 year warranty, 15 year lifespan. So great value for the cost. They last a long time, they're easy to replace. The Sharrows, uh, we're looking at five to seven years and that's highly dependent on the quality of the asphalt and also placement. So we're placing them in between, in the traveling between where the tires go. So that should increase lifespan. So we're hoping to get upwards of seven years. Now in the last slide, we saw that the expense was um, much higher for shares than it is for line painting, but line painting, they get, they get redone every one to two years. And that's part of um, life cycle maintenance that um, both the county and the township um, are involved in. Township staff do parking lot line painting. I'm not sure if they do anything on the roads county does do their roads so um that would be something they'll have to um, fill in the gaps um i think that might be it for me and um greg do you have some more to add yeah thanks matt that that was great um matt and i have been working together on this for some time and uh it uh it's a difficult project to keep moving forward when it's not necessarily part of our routine uh, uh, work, but um, I think we're coming along quite nicely. If you go to the next slide, uh, page 20 there, um, I mentioned kiosks at the beginning. Really, um, you know, it would be nice if you were able to navigate um, these loops without uh, a piece of paper in your hand um, and a kiosk would be a great way to enable that. Um, and there, we have not identified any uh, locations for kiosks just yet, but this is an example of what the county did uh, for the Trestle Bridge Trail. Um, I believe this one it was at uh, Beatty Line um, and uh, fairly simple and straightforward with a map and some permitted uses. Um, so we, uh, I would like to start developing those once we've um, finished off the uh, portion of the project that we've <laughs> just discussed. Um, yeah, I think that's it for kiosks. And then there's just one last slide. And um, I just wanted to briefly mention that, uh, you know, for those that enjoy using their phone to get around. Um, I, I'm looking at developing uh, an application that you can uh, go to on your phone. We can link from our website or from the brochure or from or perhaps from the kiosk itself. Um, and you'd be able to follow follow along the route on your phone. Um, I think that's all I wanted to mention. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good, good presentation. Um, so we have some conversation about this or does anyone have any questions before we reflect? Neil? Uh, Greg, do you have any slide? I'm, I'm concerned about the South River Road and, and what the, the uh, loop looks like on the road. Is it a bike lane on that portion? Is it uh, your green um, shallow that just kind of marks that there's bikes allowed to use that section or 
how are we defining that road? It's, I, I get calls every day on traffic problems on that road, speeding on that road, and I'm concerned about putting bikes on there without a designated bike lane. Yeah, well, um, I understand, Neil, and I think one of the challenges we have uh, with any route that we uh, look at is that, um, you know, a lot of a lot of these routes are of varying the the trails themselves vary greatly in terms of the condition um, and and the width of the road allowance and the shoulder width. Um, I think part of us signing it and uh, adding sharrows is to enhance the safety along these routes. Um, there, there's a, um, there's an app that cyclists use that actually GPS is the location of every cyclist that uses this app. Uh, the name escapes me right now. And it's been collecting data for years and years now, and it has, uh, thousands of users around the world. And, uh, what it shows is that, um, cyclists use roads throughout center wellington on a regular basis um, and there's really no preventing a cyclist from using any road um, but i think we're trying to take measures to enhance the safety along this road south river road and the hope is as well neil that um, by when, when it's time to reconstruct a road that the trails master plan and the active transportation plan is taken into account. Um, and so I, I hope that kind of addresses your question, but I do feel like we're, there are, there are definitely issues that will need to be addressed. And that includes the crossing at South River Road of the trails loop where the trestle bridge meets South River Road. So we have identified some of those locations that are rather treacherous. Yeah, I, I've got, we're, we're digging that up right now. The, the, the beginning of South River Road is under construction. And I'm wondering, is there any conversation to either widen it or when they repave it, put some portion that's marked as a designated bike lane? Was there any discussion between the township and the county via via that? I can speak to that a little bit, uh, Neil. My understanding is that they're, they're gonna reinstate it the way it is now with a one meter paved shoulder on both the north and south side. So it's, it's still not ideal for biking, but it's still considered a bikeable road. And that's bet between Bridge Street and as you enter um, Union Street West, I guess it would be uh, by Brayside. So what we're trying to do is either have a, a paved shoulder and signage or signage and sharrows. So along that stretch, it'll be a combination. As you enter into Fergus, there'll be some um, sharrow markings on the road before and after intersections. So if you enter the road and you're, you're driving a car and you enter the road, you'll see that marking on the, on the, on the street right away, which, which tells you this is um, an area that's used by cyclists and any any place that you enter the road you'll you'll have that um that messaging and then again the signage will be throughout the area so we're, we're doing our best to to make it a safe area and again to speak to what greg brought up earlier this this loop is not considered um you know a beginner cycling loop it's considered to be the commuter loop for experienced cyclists. We've, we've had a lot of input on this from, from especially Colin in the infrastructure. And he feels um, it's an important type of, of um, cycling infrastructure to have. So, you know, we'd be happy to, um, to take suggestions on other ways we can improve it, but, but we think it's a, a valuable one to start with. Yeah, and just to add to that, uh, Matt, um, an example where we have some little wins is that um, 
the development uh, known as Grandwood, where um, Waterloo Street and York Street East, Halls Drive area is. Um, correct, uh, expand on what we did there, Matt. I think we have a, uh, a trail separate from the road there. Is that correct? Sorry, yeah, that's right. We've, um, in that section beside Grandwood Phase 3, that's the Waterloo Street um, Road, we've asked for a three meter wide paved um, trail that follows on the west side. So we had the opportunity when the developer was um, preparing their plans to say rather than have a one and a half meter sidewalk on either side, that we get a three meter wide cycling um, trail. And so that links to the Trestle Bridge Trail, and that's part of um, the Trails Loop um, that we're proposing for future future um, part of this project. Um, from my experience with the uh... Alora Cataract Trailway, one of, one of its only shortcomings is the signage within the town of Fergus. It tends to be a little, a little hard to find unless you're very familiar with it. So the, the placement and the good graphics that I'm seeing on your signage, uh, very important parts of making a trail usable. And, and signage also makes a trail official in the, sort of in the, in the, general, in the general way that, that people know there's something here that, that's marked and and, and ready to use and that it has an end at the beginning and a, perhaps a route back to where they started. So uh, these are these are all good uh, good omens for this project. Anyone else have things they would like to say about the about this? Where, where is this going now, by the way? What's the process? Um, Greg. So Greg here. Um, yeah, so um, we are hoping that um, this coming spring, we will see the installation of signage. Uh, well, basically all the components that we mentioned, um, as you can see the brochure, the mapping is um, fairly mature. Um, I think ideally uh, a kiosk would be uh, ready to be placed sometime next year, but I think for the uh, paint and the sharrows and the signs and the brochure here. Um, we're looking for uh, sometime this spring. All right. That's great. I think we're Greg also... has her hands up. Sorry, go ahead. I Sorry. don't know if you could see that. Uh, Brian Grace had her hand up. Um, sorry, um, I just have one question. I tend to be a walker, not a biker. And I'm just wondering if there's anything or any consideration of signage that would somehow alert bikers that they need to be careful of walkers. Because I find that I've stopped using, I usually walk between Fergus and Alora, and I often have stopped using that trail now because bikers come up and some are very considerate and say passing to the left and others just zoom right in and it's amazing there aren't more accidents. So I don't know if there's any possibility of somehow making some of the signage include in, including information that bikers need to be alert walkers as they're coming up behind because it's a big problem for those of us who walk. Um, yes, thank you, Grace. Um, I, I echo that as well, and um, we did, it, it's a difficult situation to address. Um, we, we tried to address it in a small way um, in that the brochure has wording on it about um, uh, it's sort of disclaimer, disclaimer for the township, but also um, asking users to share the trail, whether they're on foot or on, uh, or cycling. Um, but I think your point is duly noted and perhaps there is something more we can do on signage to um, alert users to the fact that there's, that there's multiple uses on this trail. The, um, 
what uh, what I've seen there on the county's kiosk example, it's a little more obvious about what's permitted um, and a little more space to perhaps highlight what is um, what is permitted and 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 respecting each other's use on the trail. Great, it would it would be helpful. <laughs> If there's anything that can be done, I know it, it would be a difficult challenge to put in place. Um, I ride on a lot of trails in Ontario and Quebec, uh, particularly rail trail conversions. And there is a, a kind of code of ethics if that, that's, that, that's applied that has to do with uh, telling people that you're approaching either verbally or with a bell, uh, minimizing or lowering your speed when you approach people. Most cyclists do that, but uh, certainly not everyone. So it, it is an issue. It's even an issue for other cyclists. Yeah. The slow, the, the average cyclist <laughs> like like me. So, but that's 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 a cultural thing in many ways. It's uh, yeah. unless you had signs all the way along. I was I was on a trail in Quebec last year that had a speed limit posted actively all the way along the 200 kilometer trail. So. So any, anyone else have anything they want to say or? If I can just have a bit of a last word, Brian, if everybody's done, um, I want to appreciate both the work that Matt and Greg have done to move this project forward and to continue um, to promote the trails and the loops. It's been a project that's taken a while to get to even where it is now. And I know both of them have worked hard at that. Um, right now, we're just sharing this as information, gathering feedback. Um, we hope to start, like Greg said, implementing some signage and some marketing and, and things like that. And to just address Neil's concerns, I think it's, you know, it's, it's a system that will be built a mile at a time or a kilometer at a time. And it'll take us time to get um, everything. But I think if we wait till every road were perfect before we started to promote it, we would be waiting quite some time. So I think um, everything, the, the steps they're taking for safety and concerns are excellent uh, first steps and we'll continue to work and hear feedback and make adjustments. That's sort of where we're working towards, I think. I don't know if Matt and Greg have anything to add to that, but uh, it's, um, it's a passion for both of them and part of uh, our department and infrastructure's department's uh, responsibility to try to promote using our trails and active transportation. I just wanted to finish on that point. If anyone else has anything else to add. Does anyone have anything yeah, else they want? I, well, this is Greg again. I, I would just say th thanks for that, Pat. And, uh, um, you know, we've seen a cultural shift a little bit at the county level. Uh, where this was probably not likely to happen in previous years on county roads. Um, it now seems like it's possible. So hopefully as attitudes shift and uh, like Pat said, we make, we get little wins along these routes. Uh, I think the big intention of these loops is to focus our e energy uh, on, on parts that matter um, because if, a lot of the plans that we have now uh, are quite broad and this will help focus us and, and get something achieved. Okay, well, thanks so much. That was great, that was nice. great. a great initiative. Thank you. Uh, do we, are we ready to move on to Pat? Who's going to talk about the uh, opening community services programs. Hi, yes, I can take on uh, the next 6.2. Uh, so I attached the new response framework from the province. And uh, since then, it's been adapted again by the province, the first initial three pages, which re references uh, the targets for communities moving to different um, zones. So, um, I'm not sure if it'd be best if I shared it or just uh, talk about it. Um, Devlin, I'm not sure if you wanna just share the one 
uh, I think it's about page three, which just shows the five colors. And the province uh, released this, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, if you've been paying, if you've been watching the news at all. Um, uh, and then on Monday, our community moved from yellow to orange. So there's five stages, starts with green and goes all the way to uh, complete lockdown in black. And uh, I just wanted to uh, maybe scroll down one more to the next slide. I'm trying to remember which page we want to look at here. Uh, till we get to the five colors across. Um, one more, there we go. So I just wanted to bring up uh, that uh, the township has been uh, reacting as we moved from green to yellow and then to orange, very within two weeks. And um, I just uh, wanted to answer any questions people have. In, um, I just have a couple of notes here I wanted to share. Just let me open that up. It's hard with only one screen. So um, we have continued to open facilities as our framework uh, provided. So the fitness center opened October 19th. The senior center opened October 26th and pickleball started on Monday, November 16th. And these decisions are made far beyond before this uh, framework was released, but we continue. And so we've been making some adjustments to our openings to accommodate what orange means. And so, for example, we had to reduce the number of participants in fitness and aquafit classes and ensure that people were three meters apart. That was the difference between yellow and orange. Um, we have shifted some fitness equipment in the weight room to confirm that we um, can allow participants to maintain a social distance or physical distance of three meters, which is a new requirement. Um, there is new signage in these fitness spaces to educate those users of the new changes. At the entrances to our facilities, there's additional screening and tracking uh, required by the township. So you'll see that everyone that enters the sportsplex, for example, must check in to the customer service counter um, and not just walk by. There's a little bit more stringent tracking and screening. Um, there's a reduction of recreation programs to a maximum of 10 people. And that um, impacts us in areas like the senior center. So when we think of recreation programs, it's programs in a multi-purpose room or a gymnasium. And then we have the reduction of only one parent or guardian as a spectator um, in recreation activities for participants 18 and under, um, otherwise no spectators. Um, in red, which we're not there, but um, everybody's sitting on the edge of their seat wondering what may happen in the next couple of weeks as Ontario's numbers of COVID uh, uh, increase. So if we do move to red, uh, there's more screening, um, but the significant change that we're reading now in the document is the change in ice use to 10 maximum on the ice. Uh, right now we're permitted, uh, well, the, the province allows 50. So we break that down into two groups of 25 so that we can allow back-to-back -back rentals. And so there's 25 on the ice now, and this uh, reduces that to 10. So in a potential opportunity, I'll call it, or <laughs> requirement to pivot to, to red, our team has been meeting and also connecting with our sport user groups uh, to make sure that they're ready to pivot um, or at least have a plan because the province gives us maybe 24 hours to make changes. Um, for team sports, there are no games or scrimmages. You can practice only in red and dressing rooms are out of service. Um, and that is except for pools. Pool change rooms continue to be open. So I was just trying to share with you that we are well aware of orange and red and uh, ready, getting ready if we have to pivot or move back to yellow, regardless of where the province goes. We also may see changes to the red once it's released because there's a lot of pushback on some of those items but, uh, across the province. Just wanted to share that today. Ask any questions you may have about our framework for opening during COVID or this document. I guess, well, I'm going to say, please, please do. <laughs> if anyone has any comments, go ahead. Or questions. This this is very I useful, Jennifer, by the way. Yeah. 
I think Jennifer has her hand up. I'm not sure if you can see her, Brian. I can. Go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah, no, I just have a question. I've been hearing like um, nothing of like restaurants in our area, but hearing of restaurants and other kind of um, close by public health areas where they're kind of limiting um, guests from like living within their public health unit, trying to um, prevent, I guess, a lot of the higher like red kind of area folks coming into their establishments. I'm just kind of curious if we've been seeing or hearing anything like that locally, or if that's even something that businesses are allowed to do. Um, we definitely uh, in our area are focusing on the sports and recreation yeah. areas. Um, and I know that it is something we have addressed with some of our user groups who were playing games. Um, and making sure that those teams that are coming are within our um, Wellington Dufferin Guelph Health Unit or are in green per se. <laughs> um, yeah. However, you know, and also our policy during COVID at this state is to, for example, only rent facilities like ICE or anything else to center Wellington residents. It doesn't stop a resident from inviting somebody else uh, from another area to use their rental but uh, we, are we have that ability to, to limit that. Um, it becomes a private business versus a public business, I believe, if a restaurant is not permitting, but it is a requirement in both orange and red that restaurants track who's come, uh, their, their name, their number, and all of those kinds of things. So the legislation from what I'm reading does not restrict traveling from health unit to health unit at this time, but that may change. Um, it isn't in the legislation. So if people are doing it, it is a private decision. Or on top of the legislation, health units have the ability to enforce stricter rules. So City of Toronto, for example, closed fitness classes throughout the entire area, even though they are permitted in the red zone. So you, they can enforce a greater stipulations uh, but as far as locally with restricting restaurants I can't comment uh, further on that I don't know if you've heard anything Dorothy yeah I was just going to chime in Pat I sit with both BIAs and there has been no discussion about restriction as of yet so if things change that may change but as of today there's been no discussion about that Kim's got a question though well, I was just going to say that there hasn't been any discussion with the BIA, but I know that there has been talk at a couple of our larger restaurants that they were going to be starting to restrict or request like reservations have to be made and that they're looking just for locals for people within our Wellington County area that if they're calling out of city that they weren't going to be taking their reservations. Wow, that's interesting. I mean, I'm glad to hear that. Um, but I'm, that's the first I've heard. So good to know, Kim. Yeah, it's just been chatter, but I know one of them was like kind of set because they had, I think a group of 12 trying to come in and sit like on a Saturday and they were like, no. And then there was a bit of an argument that ensued. So he was kind of getting a little myth that people from out of area were pushing on him to let them sit in larger groups and stuff. So, yeah. That's all I had to share on that item, Brian. I'm not sure if you're trying to talk, you're on mute. I think oh, I saw I'm your good. mouth move. <laughs> I'll get used to this. It's only been nine months of it. Uh, it'll, I'm sure this will be a, this is a, a, a work in progress. We'll be hearing many different variations on all this as we, as we go along over the next few months, unfortunately. Um, anything further? Just speak up if, because I can, I can only see nine people here. So if there's anyone else, if anyone's has anything to say. Uh, okay, well, thanks. That's good information. And it's nice to have a, the, the official record, but that's more than we would normally get just looking at the paper every day. So that's, that's very useful. Uh, Grace, um, do you, you have an update for the Healthy Growth Advisory Committee? 
Yeah, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, it was a very interesting meeting. It started out with about half hour discussion um, because Maddie Smith, who was one of the members of that committee is having uh, said that she would have to leave the committee because she was moving north. I'm not sure which town she's moving to, but one of the towns that she can rent for a place that is a bit cheaper than what she could get here. And so that really sort of brought to attention something that is one of the reasons why the Healthy Growth Committee is in place and a big concern that, I mean, I think maybe many of us, certainly I have heard of people of lower income who are having to leave here because they just can't live anymore. So for one of the members of that committee to leave was you know, fairly significant and she just couldn't afford to live in this area anymore. Um, so, you know, it did, things were discussed, things, I mean, obviously the committee hasn't been sitting during COVID and so things aren't getting done, but I mean, it is a frustrating committee to be on in the sense that you want things to happen quickly and it just isn't going to happen quickly uh, because there's so many processes to go through, but it certainly highlighted the concern that is huge for that committee that that be addressed. Um, and Maddie, on a number of occasions, had brought up concerns about Airbnbs and the number of Airbnbs. And, and then that, you know, doesn't give people places to live here. So it's all works in progress, but it was, you know, fairly significant thing that happened. Um, and then um, the rest of the meeting was basically a presentation about something called the development permit system, um, which is something that was introduced in... Um, to Ontario in quite a while ago, I think 2000, for, to communi communities in Ontario. And it basically is meant to streamline the process so things can get done quicker. Um, it hasn't been used much, but I guess um, it, uh, communities are being encouraged to use it more because it is a process that if the work is done ahead of time to um, define the goals, then the process can be streamlined and things can be done quicker because I think developers find it frustrating to maybe initiate doing certain projects and then find they can't because there's, you know, the, the neighbors don't want a building that might be a little higher. So um, a lot of work has to be done, but it seemed to me a little bit exciting because anything to me that streamlines the process is exciting <laughs> because it takes so long to get things done, even if people are of, of good intention to do it. So that was the, the main thing uh, about that. And um, from now on, um, Brian was the alternate on that committee and with a few things going on in my life, um, I think Brian, um, we have spoken and he'll probably uh, continue on that committee as the representative to this committee here um, if you're all okay with that. Oh, no thumbs down that I can see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And thanks, Grace, for, for doing what you did. And I'll, I'll continue to, to talk with you about urban, yeah. urban issues. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Grace. Oh, did anyone have any questions or concerns? I'll just reiterate Grace's thoughts that it was sad that uh, Maddie had to leave the community and leave the committee. And that's that's the reason for the committee to be here and, and help us find a way to make affordable housing all across the, the township. And that's, that was just the greatest irony, I thought, that uh, mm -hmm. somebody who was on that committee can't afford to live here. And that just yeah. highlights we have to address it. Two words. Thank you. Um, I guess this is this is you, Matt. Matt Tucker, Parks and Facilities. Sorry, I think we missed the. Did we miss the councillor update before uh, healthy growth? It's actually not. It's actually not on here. But not, on agenda, so. <laughs> not on the agenda, though. Not on the agenda, but it's jump this, right in, Neil. I have on mine six point three council update. I, have I don't have thing. it on mine. I don't have it on mine, so I wasn't Devlin? prepared for anything. But I'll do something <laughs> off the top of my head. Yeah, I'm looking at it, but I'm sorry if it didn't get on there. Yeah. <laughs> well, we so it doesn't have to be written on paper or on a screen. We can we can always have it. Well, I've been on so many committees, so I'm trying to think of what can I tell you about council. Um, 
they're working through the business of the township. That's for sure. The biggest uh, issue we have before us right now is the uh, procedural bylaw, which you might want to be aware of because procedural bylaw, how we conduct business in the, in the township council will filter down to the committees because it kind of uses it as the framework for how we operate. Although this committee is doing it by consensus, so it's a little bit easier, but it, it helps with how the agenda gets formed and public participation in the process. So those are the big things that we're working on right now. And, and uh, we've actually struck an ad hoc committee and we're, we're working through that. So budget time is coming up. We did move a fair number of business uh, to January because we wanna focus on the budget. The budget's been pushed out to January for the first time. And that would be because of COVID and we need to understand the cost of what COVID is doing to our community how it affected our budget and, and what projects can go forward and what projects can't. So that's the biggest thing that council is dealing with right now. But that'll be an ongoing process and we'll get to it eventually. It'll come in January and hopefully we do it right this time. Thanks, Neil. Now, shall we proceed to Matt Tucker? Well, on some of our agendas, it does say that 6.5 is indoor turf facility, but I think, Kurt, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you have anything. Uh, last time you basically said that was on hold. But it's ready to go. You... We're taking it's bookings. Done. <laughs> it's done. The turf's in, the walls are up, and we're taking bookings. We're ready to play. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> no, that's wrong. I have nothing to report. Yeah. Sadly, nothing to report. You know, this meeting's public and I'm going to hear about that now, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not live streamed or taped, Neil. You're good to go. We're yeah. good. Okay. Sorry. I didn't uh, want to cut you off there, Brian, but it seems like some of the agendas okay. didn't make I it. Think we have different now agendas. we're ready to move to seven. <laughs> All right. 7.1 exactly is what I have. Uh, Mr. Tucker? I'm up. Perfect. I know I've got a couple items I just want to discuss. Um, just one, um, I know Neil brought up um, about the outdoor ice rinks there at last meeting and uh, Jennifer fired an email off earlier this week or late last week, just um, just chatting about the ice rinks. Just to give you an update, um, I chatted with the Bellwood Lions and they're a go to um, put an outdoor ice rink out at the Ball Diamond again this year. Uh, the little boards are currently up. Um, had a great discussion with them. Um, also had a discussion uh, with Dave Alves, who takes care of um, the Bissell Park um, ice rink. Um, one thing that um, we need uh, just to finish up, we're just putting together uh, some protocols, um, very similar to when we had um, the Hort Society or the Fergus Hort Society uh, beautify uh, Fergus. Their volunteers had to fill out a form um, just because of COVID. Uh, so we're looking at uh, setting that, a similar form up for, for our ice rink volunteers to fill out. Um, it, um, it's very, it, it shouldn't uh, be too painful for them to follow that, but we're, um, we're going, going to assist with uh, signage and uh, very similar to uh, similar signage to what we had with our splash pads and our skate parks where we have to limit um, the amount of people um, on the ice surface. So um, we're just uh, putting that together. I'm hoping by um, hopefully later this week or early next, the signage um, will be off to the printers and, and um, we'll have everything up uh, for the, the um, ice rinks. Um, our staff are going to look at um, putting an ice rink at the Elora Community Center and um, also look at uh, doing something here at the um, Sportsplex in Fergus. Um, hopefully where we, um, in past years at the Allure Community Center, we've had a volunteer uh, from across the street. I just haven't heard uh, from, from them yet. If we don't, I know our staff are going to assist and, and uh, try and get both locations going. So we have um, additional areas for, um, for families and, and people to get out and, and skate and, and play. I threw out the other, the other parks. Um, I'm still waiting to hear back from, from a couple different volunteers uh, to see if um, 
that are going to help assist us again this year. So I'm, I'm still waiting to hear here on those ones. If um, I do get an update, I'll, uh, I'll pass that on to the committee. Does anybody have any questions on the outdoor ice rinks at all? Great. Um, just, just moving on then. Oh, sorry, Brian. <laughs> sorry, I, I'm used to sitting and throwing out lines, and it, it <laughs> all goes. Over. When you have to push a button, I uh, just sit. Any, can you predict when the ice is going to be open? That's just a throwaway. Of course, you can. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could. We're not having that. a repeat of last year, right, Matt? That was there yeah. Was no last year last was a horrible year. year. I'm hoping. <laughs> hopefully not. It'd be uh, nice to have an outdoor activity for for families and and uh, kids to get out and and have some fun. Um, just a, just a couple other projects just to bring you up to date. Um, the uh, the washroom um, it's at Southridge is completed, so. Um, we're closing it up for um, obviously the winter. We're going to winterize it. Um, this washroom here was donated by Wright Haven Homes. Um, so we'll look to have a bit of a ribbon cutting in the spring, um, just, to, just to show the community um, with his generosity. Um, so it's uh, actually, it's a really nice, uh, nice washroom, um, I think. You know, with the trail users and, and people coming to use um, the playground and uh, the, the fields there, I, I think it's um, it's going to be really well used. And uh, if you get a chance to go by it, it really fits in well with the park. It um, he's made it look like a little um, mini home. I know um, looks like a great doghouse. If I ever get into trouble, it'd be, <laughs> it'd be a good place to hang out. But anyhow, no. Um, They've done a great job on that, and, and uh, I'd like to thank um, Stephen Wright uh, for that donation. Um, another project um, on the way, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to drive by O'Brien Park. Uh, the splash pad um, is, is pretty much done. Um, the playground is pretty much done. We're just uh, working on, on uh, finishing the washroom and the mechanical room at that location. So. Um, that uh, is hopefully coming to an end by the end of this year, uh, fingers crossed. Um, another um, park project um, that actually has been donated by um, Wright Haven is in, the, um, in his subdivision, the Grandwood subdivision. And uh, we're um, looking at uh, final completion of that project. So it, it consists of like a gazebo um, trail through the park, as well as a playground. Um, also, there's an area uh, for a future um, outdoor ice rink as well. We've, we've brought in um, water and um, hydro for that to happen. So if, if you're out and about, that's a, it's another park that, um, that Steve Wright has, has donated uh, to the community. Um, so again, Steve, we're, we've been fortunate to, to have um, Working with him, it's, it's been a pleasure, that's for sure. Um, one other park um, that we're looking to take over very soon as well is in uh, the Storybrook subdivision. It's the, the first phase. Um, the park is complete. Um, just to give you guys an idea where Storybrook is, it, it's uh, the Sabora um, subdivision just uh, on the S Bend Road um, between the Lauren Fergus, um, just off of BD Line. So. Um, again, that's, uh, it's amazing, you know, we're getting uh, more and more parks in, in Center Wellington, uh, which is going to keep um, our parks guys busy. Does um, anybody have any questions at all on, on those projects? You forgot to tell Kurt that there, uh, there's a mini soccer field at, we maybe we did last time, Storybrook Phase 1 has a Yes, it has a yes. Youth size is it youth or mini, but it is yeah. yeah, it's a youth size um, field. So that yeah. is the new indoor turf. I mean, outdoor turf is something. Yeah, that we <laughs> there it is. If it gets cold enough, we can look at uh, making a bit of an igloo. Yeah, that's right. We'll take whatever we can get. Yep. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thanks. Thank you very much, Matt. Oh, much Jennifer, appreciated. Love Jennifer, seeing all those question. parks. Oh, that's um, great. Now I think it's Dorothy's turn. I think Jennifer had a question. Yeah. Just a oh, quick question. question. 
Um, have we heard anything back about any of the Trillium or any other of the grants that have been applied for? Still nothing on any of the grants? Uh, the one that we were discussing or the earlier infrastructure was, yeah. And then, yeah. So there's the ICIP grant. No, we are not uh, hearing anything back yet on that one. Uh, but what the good news is, is there's a number of grants that have been uh, sort of rolling out. We're hearing about uh, the application processes are being released. Uh, there's a new infrastructure grant from ICIP. There is another um, community improvement grant. So there's a number of things that we are tapped into right now. And we'll definitely looking at what are great matching projects. Um, for those applications as we get more details. So always looking for grants, more money, the better, right? And I know that there's been some other ones that have been forwarded out to uh, cultural areas and things like that, that they can apply to. So yeah, we're working on it, but no, we haven't heard about that one. Any other questions? Now it's Dorothy. Thanks, Brian. Um, I just want to update the committee on speaking of grants. Our community impact grants are now available for groups to apply to. Um, I've put an ad in the local newspaper as well as updated our website. And I've actually reached out to everybody who's applied in the past um, to advise them that the grants are now open. So the deadline to apply is December the 11th. And I've changed the process slightly this year just because of COVID. Um, so they're going to arrive electronically. And my hope is that I will have an opportunity to review them all, especially the financial statements. And I can kind of narrow down everything that I send to you folks, because if I send everything to you electronically, including financial statements, you probably will not be able to open them because the files are going to be so large. So my goal is I'll probably have to send them one, as a, one at a time as I get through them. And then we'll have discussion. Um, it will have to be after the budget is approved in January. I'll give them kind of a preliminary outlook as to um, the amount of dollars being applied for. And then we can take a report after we've had a chance to review them likely in February. That's, that's the goal. I'm not going to get these to you and expect you to do them over the holidays, that's for sure. So that's my, that's my update right at the moment. Is there any questions? Okie doke. Well, you'll start seeing emails from me. Um, and also, I just want to share that there are, I, I'm getting inquiries from groups that uh, have not even applied in the past. So I think we're gonna see a lot more um, applications this year than we have in the past. So I will keep you posted. And as I get them, you'll get a copy of them electronically. Okay, thank you. I was just gonna add Dorothy that, thank you to everybody for your discussion last meeting because council did adopt your recommendation. Uh, so those that had money to roll over are being permitted to roll that over to 2021. So. Uh, that was uh, accepted by council. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Pat. I forgot about that. Perfect. Well, um, it's looking like if, if I have the, if, if, if whichever version of the agenda I have, uh, do we have any other, I guess we have uh, departmental and capital projects update is next. Gee, I was hoping it wasn't on your agenda and I could just go home now. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, I don't have a lot. I mean, last meeting we went over all of the status of our capital projects. So I just wanted to bring you up to speed on a few things in the department. Um, I did want to mention, I forgot to mention during the I, um, framework piece, we did run into some operational challenges with our ICE this year, just uh, trying to get um, compliance from the users with the um, changes to the use of the ice. And so I commend our staff for working through that with our ice users and all of the parents and little participants. And I think that did delay us moving into sort of our phase two, which are private rentals and phase three, which would be rentals outside of our traditional, right now what we have is our operating hours. So 
we're, uh, depending on how orange and red goes, we're hoping to get some private rentals out in the next, uh, next week, I think. Is that right, Matt? Yes, no, that's correct. We, we've reached out um, to our, our um, adult user groups that we've had in the past that have been typically there year after year. And, um, you know, we've, we've uh, shown them our protocols and um, they're, um, they're slowly coming in. I know there's a lot of questions just with um, concerns with our protocols and, and uh, there's some, um, some groups that are saying, you know what, um, you know, we're going to hold off till next year. Um, um, with and, but that being said, there's there's four that um, that are showing some interest uh, that we've had um, in past years. So um, yeah, we're we're working through it. And um, like I said, with Pat saying, you know, we're not sure where we're going to end up. Maybe next week, what um, what color we're going to be. So um, we're we're ready to go uh, back and forth through the colors as we move forward. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to share, uh, as Neil mentioned, we're in what we call budget season. And on December 1st is a lengthy budget meeting all afternoon. But at, uh, I think it's at four o'clock, uh, we will be inviting any public delegations who would like to come and comment on uh, the budget or make requests within the budget. So that is a good time to tune in and hear what the public is asking about. Um, these meetings are live streamed. So if anyone on this committee wants to listen in um, at all, I'm gonna actually look at either Devlin or Lisa because I'm trying to remember the meeting starts at one, I believe, and uh, should end by five with public delegations at four. Did I get that right, Lisa? Or Devlin? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I should have looked it up before I started. Lisa, you're yeah. muted. Lisa, you're still muted. <laughs> okay, sorry. Go. I had too many screens open. I was trying to look it up. Um, I don't, typically delegations are at 5 p.m. Okay. Okay. Anyways, anybody can register as a delegation up until almost the day before. But uh, we strongly encourage people to do that well in advance so that they can submit their stuff to be on the agenda. So what that, that is one of our pre-budget meetings, uh, opportunity for delegations. Then uh, the budget book will actually be released on December 21st. So that would be the public's first opportunity to um, take a look online and seeing what the budget um, includes. And then the January 5th and 7th, uh, right when we get uh, back after holidays will be the final budget deliberations uh, sort of all day meetings with council um, just to give you the dates and the times and see the progress we're making on the 2021 budget. The, Sorry Pat, I had yes. too many things open. Um, <laughs> I believe delegations are actually at 5 p.m. Uh, that's typically the time we do them every year and yes the meeting does start at 1. See, once again, I was just trying to get out earlier, but okay, it's 5 p.m. for delegations. Thank you. Um, the building condition audits were completed at all of our facilities and we are awaiting the reports. So this is a project the township took on to um, really help with our asset management plan, um, taking a look at all of our facilities and some pavilions and sheds and things like that to um, help us with our uh, facility equipment replacement uh, program. Um, so that was a big project and uh, we'll hopefully have those all of those results soon. And uh, it was a big project. So we're, we're glad we're moving forward with that information. One uh, assessment we did do outside of our own buildings was uh, for the Laura Center for the Arts. So that building what received a building condition audit as well. And we have been working with that group on the results of their audit. So um, that helps them, as everybody knows in the arts community, they have an old heritage building which um, needs a lot of TLC. So this helped uh, focus what their biggest uh, building condition issues were. So that was something that um, we helped the community with. Uh, this one asset that they needed some assistance with. 
Um, we have our next meeting. Uh, we are hoping to bring to you a summary of where things are with each of the McDonald grants. So those were, uh, uh, I guess, distributed in uh, 2018 and some are complete and some are still being worked on and some were put on hold due to COVID, but we'd like to bring that back to you. So hopefully we will have all of that and potentially the Laura Center for the Arts may come to that meeting as a delegation. Um, but that will be on the agenda once they, um, once they confirm that. So those are some of the projects happening um, township wide and inside our department. Much of our focus has been on um, the framework and getting our facilities the council message, and Neil may want to speak to this, has very much been uh, get the facilities open, get as much as we can back to normal inside our community, but we still have to think about the safety of staff and patrons. So it's been a bit of a balancing act, um, but uh, that's our that's our sort of our mission to try and get things back to normal, but make sure that it's safe. Um, I think that's sort of the message we've been hearing from council. Neil, I don't know if you want to comment. Oh, that's the message. I just wanted to highlight the fact we're not going to do it unless it's safe. And if we feel it's unsafe, we'll take a step back. The public safety would be uh, front front of mind and uh, top priority. Yeah, and I think that's some of the feedback we're getting, just so you're aware. It's sort of like, well, why are you opening pickleball when you haven't got shinny started? Well, they're completely different types of activities with completely different parameters on how they are permitted to operate. So it's, it's, a, it's a juggling between what is uh, safe and what is considered higher risk. So we'll get there one step at a time and uh, hopefully um, our numbers go down and we can continue to operate as we are. That's all I had, Brian, unless there's any other questions from anyone on, on the department operations or capital projects. Are there any? Okay, well, Sorry, Brian. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, just before we go, I just wanted to congratulate Dunsmith here for her Hope Award. Um, congratulations. Well deserved. Did you Thank repeat you that? You, you, you broke up in the middle of that and I didn't hear what you said. Oh, sorry. I said I just before we uh, were to leave, I wanted to congratulate Councillor Dunsmore on his, I think it's the first year for Hope Award. Um, yeah. for his recent uh, campaign that he did there. Thank you, Jennifer. They actually named the award after me. It's the Neil Dunsmore Here for Hope Award. And, and uh, they did something that was impossible when they presented it to me. They left me absolutely speechless, so. <laughs> we, can, we can all go yep. off mute and clap. Congratulations. Yeah, bravo. <laughs> You're the man. Thanks for sharing that, Jennifer. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, well, it, I don't know when our next meeting is, but uh, is it on the? Is it on here? Sorry, I've been going back and forth. Um, our next screen. meeting, Brian, and this is maybe a question for Pat. It's scheduled for December 9th. Um, and then after that, we go to, I believe, the first. Oh, let's see, the second or third week of January. Um, so I just wanted to check and make sure that we are going ahead with that December meeting because it's only about three weeks from now. Um, well, I think I'd like to get the McDonald, if we have the McDonald reports uh, ready to present, I would like to hold the meeting. If for whatever reason that report is held up due to, you know, we're waiting on information from some of these groups, then we'll hold off. But otherwise I think I'd like to hold that meeting so we can continue in January, February, and March with the grant uh, discussion. And we don't wanna get uh, a meeting that runs too long with too many agenda items. So, uh, and then we did decide to move our request to move our meetings to the first Wednesday of the month in the new year. Um, that would be the sixth. Yeah, and uh, that I believe report goes to council this meeting to discuss and approve the council schedule and committee schedule. So we will be able to report out all the meeting times in January once that is passed. Great. I hope I got that right, Lisa. 
You did get that right. It goes forward on Monday to be finally approved November 30th, following which committee members should expect to see lots of appointments appear in their calendars. Great. Well, all that being said, um, I think I think we've come to an end unless uh, my my agenda has something else on it that I'm missing. Uh, look forward to seeing you all on December the 9th. Take good care. It's a troubling time, but uh, it, we're, we're, we can do it. Anyway, thanks again. Have a great month, or well, a great three weeks, and we'll talk again on December the 9th, probably. Thanks, Cheers, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye -bye.